Hi guys, so today we're going to talk about the assessment of the motor system. So this is part of the neurologic examination. So as you remember, last video we did the cranial nerves. So now we're going to talk about the assessment or the examination of the motor system. So for the assessment of the motor system, there's actually like a few components to this. So we need to assess um, the patient's body positions. Uh, the muscle, the characteristics of the muscles, like the muscle tone, the muscle bulk, and the muscle strength. Um, we also need to assess the patient's um, coordination, the patient's gait, and the patient's stance. So for body position, we just observe the patient's um, body positions during rest and during movement. The second thing that we need to identify is the presence of any involuntary um, muscle movements. For example, um, any tremors, any ticks, or any fasciculations. And then after this, we need to assess the important characteristics of the muscles, including the muscle bulk, the muscle tone, and the muscle strength. So for muscle bulk, we need to assess the size and the contour of the muscles. So um, are the muscles like, do they look flat and slightly like concave? Or are, do they look full? Um, if um, the muscles are like flat or concave in shape, then this may be um, indicative of atrophy. So when inspecting for atrophy, you need to pay particular attention to certain body parts, such as the hands, the shoulders, the thighs, and the legs. So for example, um, when you're assessing muscle bulk, you could look at the patient's hand. So the spaces between the metacarpals should be full or just a little bit slightly depressed, okay? And the um, thenar and hypothenar eminences of the palm should look full and slightly convex. Um, if you see furrowing between the, um, the spaces between the metacarpals or the flattening of the thenar and the hypothenar eminences of the palm, then that again suggests atrophy. And atrophy may not necessarily be an abnormal thing. This may be physiological because, you know, as we age, we normally lose muscle anyway. But it can also be um, pathological. So it can be due to um, motor neuron disease or um, it can be due to malnutrition. To assess muscle tone, we need to um, feel the patient's muscles resistance to passive stretch, okay? So to do this on like the upper body, on the arms, what we need to do is we need to um, just flex and extend the patient's wrists, um, elbows, uh, fingers, and put the shoulder through a moderate range of motion, right? And obviously do that to the other hand the other arm. And to do this, um, to test muscle tone on the legs, the patient has to be lying supine. And what you need to do is you need to um, support their thigh with one hand and grasp the, the, um, the foot with the other hand. And again, you just flex and extend um, the knee and the ankle. And again, feel for that, um, the resistance of the muscle to your um, passive stretch. The next thing that we need to assess is muscle strength. So we need to keep some things into consideration when we're assessing the patient's muscle strength. So um, muscle strength may vary depending on the patient's age, the patient's sex, and um, the patient's level of like, you know, training, especially resistance training, if they go to the gym, for example. Um, also, their dominant side might be slightly stronger than their non-dominant side. Um, also, one thing I need to tell you is that um, the muscle is strongest when it's the shortest and the muscle is um, weakest when it's the longest. So um, those are like the important considerations that we need to keep in mind when we're doing um, assessment for muscular, for muscle strength. Also, when assessing uh, muscle strength, we use like a grading system to grade muscular strength. So this is called the MRC scale. MRC is just like the institution that came up with this grading system for muscle strength. So this scale grades um, muscle strength from zero to five. Zero being, being um, no, um, like no muscular contraction. So you would see no movement of the muscle and you would feel no contraction of the muscle. Okay, so let's use, let's use a muscle. Uh, to illustrate this this point because it would I think it would make sense if uh, if we do that So let's take the quads for example because that's such a big muscle. So 
we ask the patient to lie on an examination bed, yeah? And we ask them to contract the quads, which extends the knee, right? So if the muscle strength is zero, it means that we would see no active movement. We would see no movement of the muscle, no contraction, no nothing whatsoever. We can also feel the quads and we would feel no movement. For grade one, um, we would feel or we would see just like a flicker of movement, very, very minimal um, movement, very minimal muscle contraction, but it's not totally zero, okay? So that's um, grade one. Grade two is um, active movement with gravity eliminated. So that means that um, the, the range of motion is only achieved when gravity is not in the equation. So we do this by asking the patient to lie on one side and we, um, we flex their knee. And then what we do is we ask them to extend the knee by contracting the quads. If they're able to do this, so in this way, because they are on one side, gravity is not in the equation. So we eliminate gravity here. Um, if they're able to do this, then this is uh, grade two, okay? Grade three is active movement against gravity without any resistance, okay? So in this case, we can ask the patient to um, sit on the examination bed with their legs hanging down. We ask them to contract their quads to extend the knee. And if they are able to achieve this without resistance, then um, here they are working against gravity now because their legs are hanging down. So gravity is trying to pull their leg down as they try to contract the quads to extend the knee. So if they're able to achieve this, this is grade three, okay? Grade four is active movement against gravity with some resistance. So again, patient is sitting on an examination bed with their uh, legs hanging down. What the examiner does is apply some sort of resistance on like the shin, like just to push it down as the patient tries to contract the quads to extend the knee. And um, it's grade four if um, the patient is able to do this with some resistance. So grade five, which is considered the normal, um, is active movement against gravity with full resistance, okay? So that means that the examiner can be exerting um, the full resistance, so literally trying to push it down, and the patient is actively resisting this um, this. Um, contradicting force okay so those are um, the gradings so grade 0 to grade 5 when testing for muscle strength we could start with the biceps and the triceps so we do this by asking the patient to bend at the elbow yeah again this is the biceps triceps are here <laughs> so what we do is again we ask the patient to bend at the elbow and we try pull the hand away and ask the patient to resist our pulling. So we just ask them to keep, um, to keep flexing, right? So I'm trying to pull, okay? And then for the extension of the triceps, we just do the opposite. So ask the patient to flex at the elbow. And what we do is we try push the hand, the, the, the arm or the hand down here yeah? and ask the patient to resist that pushing down movement. So um, this is testing again the extension of the triceps, right? So I'm pushing down and the patient is trying to resist that downward um, force, okay? And then we test the flexion and extension um, of the wrist. So recall that extension is the lengthening of the angle between two joints. So this is, what is this? <laughs> and what is this? Which one is flexion? Which one is extension? <laughs> yeah, okay. So this is extension because you're um, widening the angle between the joints. This is flexion. Okay, so to test for extension and flexion at the wrist, again, we ask the patient to make a fist and to um, point their, what do you call this, knuckles downwards. So this is extension, right? And what we do is we try pull it up. We try like straighten their hand and ask them to resist their movement. For um, wrist flexion, we ask the patient to again make a fist and point their knuckles up, okay? 
And what we do is we try push it down and ask the patient to resist that pushing down force, right? And then um, for grip strength, we what we do is we cross the um, the middle finger over the index finger, and we ask the patient to squeeze as hard as they can as we try take our fingers off from their hands. And we do this on both hands simultaneously so we can compare the grip strength between um, you know, the two hands. To test the strength of finger um, abduction, what you need to do is ask the patient to um, have their, their palms facing down and spread their fingers. So this is finger abduction, okay? So um, what you need to do is to like, kind of like, Try press them in inwards to provide resistance, and ask the patient to resist, to per, to like stop you from bringing their fingers closer together. Okay, so that's to te how to test for um, finger abduction, and then the next one is thumb op thumb opposition. So um, palm face up. Ask the patient to try touch their pinky with their thumb as you apply um, a resisting force, as you try to prevent them from doing that. So you're trying to like, um, like pull the thumb up as they try reach for um, the, the tip of their pinky with their thumb, okay? And then you move on to testing muscle strength in the lower extremities. So um, you start firstly with the hips. So the patient is lying supine. We need to test for hip flexion and hip um, extension. So for hip flexion, we're mainly testing the um, iliopsoas muscle. So what you need to do is, patient is lying supine, place your hand on the anterior aspect of the thigh. And you ask, you like provide resistance by kind of pushing it down. And you ask the patient to um, like push up against your hand that's pushing it down, okay? And then for hip extension, you need to put your hand on the posterior aspect of the thigh, lift it up a little bit, and ask the patient to um, try bring their leg or their thigh back down to the bed, basically resisting um, your, um, your pushing up movement, okay? And then for hip um, adduction and abduction. So let's first start with hip um, abduction. So hip abduction is moving it away from the midline. So what you need to do is you need to place your hands on the lateral aspect or the lat lateral side of the knee. And you ask the patient to try spread their legs um, against your knee that's providing that resistance. Yeah. And then for hip adduction. So um, for hip adduction, Adduction is moving, um, moving it closer to the midline. So you place your hands on the medial aspect or the medial side of the knee. And you ask the patient to try bring their legs closer or close together. Okay, so that's for um, the hips. I think I mentioned that um, hip flexion is testing the strength of the iliopsoas. Um, hip um, extension is testing the gluteus maximus. Hip um, abduction is testing um, the gluteus minimus and gluteus medius. The next thing that we need to test is the extension and the flexion of the knee. So um, the muscle group responsible for the extension of the knee is um, the quadriceps. So um, the quads, they're like one of the biggest and strongest muscle groups in the body. And they are found on the anterior, lateral, and the medial side of the thigh. So this is actually a really big and powerful muscle group. So to test for muscle strength of the quads, what we need to do, again, you won't be able to see this, but I'm just going to describe it as I'm doing it. So the patient is lying supine. We need to flex at the knee and the hip slightly. So um, I'm applying a downward force, like a downward resistance. And I'm asking the patient to try straighten their leg, yeah? So I'm pushing down as the patient tries to straighten their leg. And this tests the strength of the quads. So this is for um, knee extension. So for knee flexion, which is testing the, um, the hamstrings located on the posterior side of the thigh. <sighs> okay, you won't see this. Right, let me just describe. What you need to do is to ask the patient to flex at the knee. Um, 
and keep their uh, foot like touching the examination bed as you try to um, straighten the patient's leg okay so you're kind of pulling up on the leg as they try keep their um, foot resting on the examination bed so this is testing the um, hamstring strength for um, knee uh, knee flexion okay right and then the next thing that we need to check is dorsiflexion and the plantar flexion of the foot right so imagine that this is my foot this is like the bottom side so this is my heel and these are like my toes so recall that dorsiflexion is toes pointing up plantar flexion is um, toes pointing down so to test for dorsiflexion you need to um, ask the patient to like push their toes up against your hand that's pushing them down and for plantar flexion you need to ask the patient to um, um, like push down as you apply like an upward resistance to their toes. The next aspect of the motor system that we need to assess is the patient's coordination. So um, for coordination of um, muscle movements, it requires like four different areas of the nervous system to function in an integrated way. So it requires the integrated functioning of the motor system for muscle strength, the um, the vestibular system for balance and um, like the coordination of the head, eye and body movements, the cerebellar system for rhythmic movements and um, steady posture, and finally the sensory system for precision sense. To assess the patient's um, coordination, we need to observe and assess how well they perform in three different tasks. Well, three different like group of tasks. So the first one is um, rapid alternating movements. The second one is point to point movements. And the third one is basically standing in like specific ways. Let's first start with rapid alternating movements. So to do this with the arms, um, we need to ask the patient to strike the anterior thigh with one hand and lift it, turn it over and strike the back of the hand like on kind of around the same place on the anterior thigh and do that over and over again. And we try urge the patient to do this as fast as they can, right? And what we're looking for is um, obviously the speed as, at which they can do this, the rhythm and the smoothness of the movement. And we ask them to do the same on the other hand, okay? So um, in patients with cerebellar disease, um, they would have, instead of, being a fast and regular rhythm, it would be slow and it would be irregular. So it would look something like this. You get the idea. So again, the rhythm is slow and irregular. So the um, medical term for the inability to perform rapid alternating movements is this diadochokinesia, yeah? So I'll say that again. This diadochokinesia is the um, impaired ability to perform um, rapid alternating movements. We can also perform rapid alternating movements using the hands and the fingers. So we can ask the patient to tap their thumb um, on the fingertips of the other fingers in a specific sequence. And again, we ask them to do it on the other side this side is a bit slower <laughs> and again we look for uh, the speed the rhythm and the smoothness of the movement to test rapid alternating movements with the legs what you can do is you ask the patient to tap the balls of the foot um, as rapidly as they can on like your hand or on the floor the next thing that we can assess um, are point-to-point -point movements so to do this with the arms we can ask the patient to um, like touch the tip of our finger and then their nose like alternately as we move the finger so that they have to change direction so it's gonna it's gonna look like this yeah we're constantly moving the finger and asking the patient to follow the finger um so here we are looking for again the smoothness of the movement and the accuracy of um you know, the, the patient touching the finger as it moves. 
Another thing we can do is we can just fixate the finger in one place and ask the patient to touch it and raise their arm overhead. My shoulder would click, guys. Okay, so touch it, raise their arm overhead, touch it, raise their arm overhead like several times. And then what we do is we ask them to close their eyes and then try perform the same exercise. And normally, like in normal individuals, they should be able to successfully touch the finger. But with patients with um, cerebellar disease, having their eyes closed worsens the, um, the incoordination. To test point-to-point -point movements with the legs, what we can do is to ask the patient to place one heel on the opposite knee and run it down to their big toe. Do this a couple of times and then ask them to close their eyes and perform the same exercise. And normally what should happen is that a normal individual should be able to perform this successfully. But in patients with cerebellar disease, their heel may oscillate and like slide side to side and occasionally their heel may even lift off from the shin or you know from the leg. So like I said before, with um, in patients with cerebellar disease, having their eyes closed worsens their incoordination. The next thing that we can assess is the patient's gait. So we can ask the patient to walk across the room and we just observe their posture, we observe um, the arm swing, we observe the leg movements, um, and we just observe the smoothness of the movement. So normally, what we should observe is that the balance should be intact. So the patient should be standing upright the whole time and not falling side to side. And um, the arm, they swing symmetrically at the sides and the turnings are smooth, okay? So after this, we can ask the patient to do um, what is called um, tandem walking. So this basically means that we ask the patient to walk from, well, walk heel to toe. So, um, in a straight line, so like that. Just imagine these are the patient's feet, okay? So they walk heel to toe in a straight line. This is called tandem walking. And then after that, we could ask the patient to walk on their um, toes, so the balls of their feet, to test plantar flexion, and walk on their heels to test dorsiflexion. And both of these movements would also um, test their balance. The next thing that we can do is ask the patient to hop in one place with one leg and then the other. So um, if we think that the patient might fall or um, is quite elderly, then we may assist the patient. So this tests muscle strength and um, balance as well as cerebellar function. Um, another test we can do is ask them to perform like shallow knee bends. Again, perform that on one leg and then on the other. And again, we may assist the patient if we think that they're going to fall, especially if they are quite frail or if they're, you know, too ill. And if they are too ill to do any of these tests, we could do an alternative test, which is just um, asking them to rise from a seated position without arm support. And again, this tests muscular strength and balance. And finally, we can test the patient's stance. So to assess the patient's stance, we can do two different tests. So the first one is called the Romberg test. So the Romberg test involves asking the patient to stand with feet together, um, with their eyes open first, and then close their eyes for 30 to 60 seconds. And we just note their ability to maintain that upright posture. And normally, in a healthy, normal individual, um, they should be able to stand or to hold that upright position when their eyes are open and when their eyes are closed. But if they maintain that position well when their eyes are open, but when they close their eyes, they lose the balance, then this is a positive Romberg, you know, this is a positive Romberg sign, okay? And sometimes in patients with cerebellar, actually not sometimes, but in patients with cerebellar disease, um, they would struggle to hold this upright position to balance in this position with their feet together, even when their eyes are open and a lot worse when their eyes are closed. And finally, we could um, do the test for pronator drift. So what we need to do is ask the patient to stand upright 
and have their um, arms straight forward like in front of them with palms facing up okay and ask them to close their eyes for 30 to 60 seconds and normally um, in a healthy individual they should be able to like hold and maintain this arm position for the duration of those um, 30 to 60 seconds and um, what we can also do is to tap the arm briskly downwards and normally it would return to that horizontal position um, like in a smooth manner okay